I'm Marie Cooty, uh, Creative Director of Marie Cooty Advertising, which has been bubbling along since the 80s. And also, in the past 10 years, Creative Director and Founder of Melbourne Style, which is a design studio, gallery and publishing imprint. And I'm Fiona Leeming, and I am Founder and Creative Director of Honey Communications, which was uh, started about eight years ago. This is Fiona and I at Macy's, DMBNB, in the 80s. Um, which is uh, probably a third into my terrible past. So by this stage, I'm a bit of a veteran, especially with, well, long story. But um, yeah, I think I worked in straight out of RMIT. I grabbed anything that came by and started in a tiny little advertising agency in Dandenong. Was rescued from there by an artist care rep. You won't know what artist care is, but they used to sell Letraset, and you won't know what Letraset is. So he was gorgeous and said, "What are you doing out in the sticks? I'll get you a job in town." And dobbed me to uh, a little boutique uh, design studio called Complete Creative Services, and I went there and got a job. Um, they were insane, both of them, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, twenty four hours a day. Not me, them, leaving the staff, namely me, to do all the work. Um, so it was an um, initiation by fire. We moved the studio into a real agency as a subcontracting studio. That ha used to happen quite a bit. I don't know if it still does, but in the 80s and 90s, uh, uh, intact businesses would, would subcontract all of the finished art and design work for an ad agency and do it in-house so that it takes some space and just do all their work. Plus, you do your own work, you know. And... Um, so that was in SSCMB Lintas in Albert Road in Melbourne, which was my first experience of a real agency, which was great. The art director there, Paul Meehan, was just a darling and very gentle soul, very generous with his tutoring, um, really a, a wonderful man. I'm lucky to know him again still now and, uh, and, and do, been doing projects with him today as we speak. But... Um, the agency that I... The, the small studio I mentioned sort of fell to bits, really, and... Uh, moved it to another agency which I didn't like so I started looking around to go somewhere else went to Macy's the interview is set up by the headhunter uh, Claire Worthington from Apple she sent me to the wrong guy I had this insane interview with a man who was looking for a suit not an art director and the two of us couldn't work out why what I said what was that about you know oh I sent you to the wrong person go back and see Tim Crowther she says so <laughs> go back and saw Tim, who was, Fiona was working with Tim and Tim's group, and he hired me, so Fee and I, that's where that photograph comes into play. This is about two years into our working together in that group. And um, we hit it off. We had a terrific team, and um, that's where that photo starts. That's a long time ago now, though. I think there was about five years, maybe, at Macius with Fee and the team, and uh, I went to Clemages. I was headhunted over the road. Went over to Clemages opposite uh, on the other side of St Kilda Road and didn't really like it at all. Very sort of sterile, mm, mainstream kind of uh, attitude and atmosphere compared to the fun, the sheer creative fun that we used to have at Macy's, which was, you know, unfettered madness really, but mm. with great results, great creative results. So, yeah, I found it too stayed at Clemages and um, my dear friend Julie Opre, who was... Um, a, a stylist in the industry at the time said to me, why don't you just go freelance? And so I did. And had a that's where Marie Cootie Advertising started in 86, I think. And um, I was lucky enough to get a huge account with Leo Burnett and work with Jill to play on the um, Alpine Diaries for the evil giant Philip Morris for 10 years, which was a fantastic project. Again, unfettered creative freedom, just do what you want, really with the brand because it was below the line, not above the line marketing. So did that um, for a while and then was um, approached by John Singleton uh, when, gee, early 90s to open his Melbourne agency with um, a suit and a, and a managing director. So the three of us started John Singleton in Melbourne. So um, I worked there as CD for... I don't know, three, four, five years, and then they promoted me to executive CD and put me on the board, which was another story. <clears throat> There's a, therein lies a tale. And then I ran away screaming and back to my own business and freelanced again for 
I don't know, three, four years and started up my own publishing imprint and now I do publishing books, design, a little bit of advertising and have the gallery. So that's where I'm at now. It, it was a diploma but, my God, was it fantastic. You know, it was – we did ab- absolutely everything, printmaking, life drawing, architectural drawing, you know, colour studies, cinema, photography, proce- photography process, every single creative discipline that you could imagine, we did, hands-on. So when the Mac came along – because this is pre-Mac, remember – when the Mac came along, which I now am at one with and have been for 30 years or something, um, when it came along, I just embraced it as another colour on my paint palette. So I know – you know, Adobe and before that, Quark, Inside Out, Illustrator Inside Out and Write Code and all of that. But to me, it's still just, I will still make a potato stamp. I will still use a calligraphy pen. Um, the the thing about that course at RMIT was it just taught you how to use any means whatsoever, but to remember that the purpose of what you're doing is to communicate visually. So you don't just do something because you can. It has to have a meaning and a value to support the, the message or there's no point doing it, you know. So it was a terrific course. And the disciplines that I do now, whether they're books or custom custom books, things like that I do for architects and artists, monographs and so on, they're really just a brand advertising piece with pages in it, you know. It's like a three-dimensional business card for those companies. But they need to be beautiful and they need to be have a different empathy and a different sensibility um, for a different market and a different, um, you know, arena. But it's all the same discipline. doesn't matter if it's a can of beans or... Yeah, it's just, it's just fine-tuning them and hopefully getting better at them. But loving every second of it. I mean, what a joy. It's just a great career. Uh, I wanted to be a marine biologist and I only had biology and not enough maths and chem, so I went, ah, what else can I do? I'll... My family is always drawn and painted and, you know, so on, so I could do it with great facility, so I just thought... And I had a scholarship for it, so I just took it and did it. Because I was raised by a mother and father who told me I could do, be and have anything I wanted to and I thought that was the case until I hit certain jerks around the late mid, mid to late 80s. I and think went, been what are you on, you guys? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I didn't notice them because I was immune. I'd been raised in a way that um, they were not on my radar. There were no no caveats to my career. There was nothing holding me back. So I didn't really understand them. And uh, it's only since watching Mad Men and realising that that era was not that long after the other era. And that dope that interviewed me thinking he was interviewing a suit was really from Mad Men era, you know, that guy. There were a lot of men at that age level in the agencies back then who were probably in shock over me and Fiona. And a lot of them did try and shut you down, but you didn't notice because I, I don't hear that sort of stuff. I do remember one guy saying to me, you shouldn't be so confident. You shouldn't be so, you know, trust your creative... Uh, and it was a creative director who said this to me. You should not trust your creative instincts as much as you do because one day they'll let you down. I said, oh, gee, thanks, you know, and ignored him because they haven't, they don't and they won't. But, you know, yeah, you get people who try and... You know, they'll be in shock, let's face it, <laughs> when we came along. In advertising, in that world, you were recognised. So, mm. you know... Uh, and graphic design is, is you know, uh, symbiotic, you know, uh, with um, advertising, you know. What, what you're doing is, is communication through various means, mostly visual, right? And unless you understand what you're doing with visual communication and understand strategy and the, the reasons why you're doing what you're doing and the means which you learn when you do graphic design and viscom, then you don't know all there is to know about your job, full stop. And so many people, you know, in the old days, people used to go through from dispatch area, you know, and they would say that that stood them in good stead as sales managers and as business managers and all that sort of stuff because they understood the flow and the way the machine runs. And people in businessmen would, you know, hit the factory floor and understand how it all works. Mm. Um, and you sh- this, this should be the same with advertising and um, creative expression because if you don't know how to do it yourself then you don't understand your job. Good design is communication. Good advertising is communication Mm. and at the very essence of both of them is a great idea. 
everything has to start with a great idea. You know, otherwise it's just pretty things on a page or, you know, um, something quite vacuous. So, uh, and I think that's why mm. you naturally slipped into publishing because mm. you were a storyteller and storytelling is very much a part of uh, what we had to do as well. True. And and ideas, this, for me it's always been a, a three strands to advertising and visual communication. There's the idea, of course, you know, um, but the execution and the brief have to also work perfectly in sync. Mm. Because you have a great idea and do it badly, then it's rubbish. If you do a great idea for the wrong reason, it's rubbish. If you had a great reason and a bad idea, it's rubbish. If three don't come together, if the execution too, which is what I come back to about the practical understanding Fiona and I, I know Fiona and I have, mm. the hands-on practical understanding. You know, you might have an academic understanding of the strategy and the brief and all the rest of it, but if you don't know how to execute it, the best way to execute it, you can go down the wrong street or waste money or waste time or simply not maximise the power of that idea as much as is possible because you don't understand the mechanics of execution. You know, you haven't had hands-on training. Well, my journey was uh, somewhat different to uh, Marie's. I was doing uh, Year 12 art. I loved art, uh, but that was the one subject I felt that I excelled at. And uh, uh, I had this sliding doors moment where um, I thought the only option for me as a career was going to be an art teacher. And uh, uh, one of the girls on the tram in those days said to me, uh, if you're going to be an art teacher, you need to be an artist in your own right to be a very good art teacher. And I, that really resonated. So I went to Swinburne and it was very difficult to get into Swinburne in those days. There were a lot of students trying to get into, you know, uh, a sort of a very finite um, enter score. So uh, we had to sit an exam. We had to have an aptitude to uh, creative writing, uh, thinking. It was very, very um mm -hmm different to just having a, a VCAT score these days. And uh, when I was in final year, I got headhunted. Uh, they used to send out scouts in those days to Macy's. And so that was a whole other world. And I, I uh, was very intimidated um, in the interview because it was all big mahogany desks and a terrifying that your first, Noel first Delbridge. first role was never been in the big an agency? Yeah. And, the, and Macy's was like... Advertising agency of the year. It was over several floors. It was yep. it was like entering, you know, uh, Starship, you know, um, yeah. so out of Star Wars. So uh, having done that and and started that path, uh, and in those days, uh, very very few women. Uh, you talk about Peggy out of uh, uh, you know Madman. Mad it was um, very very different, uh, and in fact, uh, the other secretaries were were quite mean to to me because they thought I was a bit of a threat that, um, you know, uh, the good-looking art directors and writers that I might be interested in them. Fabulous looking. Yeah, well, I wasn't really interested in them. Anyway, so, uh, but, uh, so that, that was the sort of start and then um, had an uh, amazing couple of years, then uh, had to work on a pitch for Sports Girl and uh, did a, a, a whole pitch and really throw yourself into it. Uh, we didn't win, another agency won, and then that agency rang me and said, come and work for us, which was a great opportunity. It was a hot shop. And I went there, and on the first day I was presented with my work that I presented at the pitch that the other agency said, we'd like you to produce this. So that was a big learning curve for me for how the industry worked because mm -hmm. uh, what we thought, you know, in terms of integrity and all that was, was really quite... Um, questionable, shall I say, in those days. But again, the idea was uh, still king and uh, and then doing amazing executions, working with the brilliant photographers, brilliant graphic designers, uh, studios. You know, we were very fortunate. There was a lot of incredibly talented people that we were exposed mm -hmm. to. Uh, the industry's changed massively. It had changed already when I arrived, when we arrived. Before that, it was very, very different with, you know, four-day lunches. So I arrived at the half-day lunch probably. Lunches are gone now, I think. Um, when I started, there was no Mac, so work that out. That We all drew. We drew layouts. There were storyboards. storyboards uh, and I could make a photocopier, do things that would make your toes curl. 
seriously, it was an instrument of joy for me and I would surf the top of it as it scanned and move images and, you know, do all sorts of stuff and crush images down using the photocopier. It was a great thing, great tool. And then, bang, who knew the Mac was going to come along? So suddenly no more typesetting markups, suddenly no more of all of that malarkey that took up so much of your life. Um, but uh, photography probably remained the same. It's different now, of course, completely different now. But back then, photographers and quality studios w were still, you know, really, really important. And um, a lot of art directors that I worked with, the blokes, I should say, the older blokes mostly, but then my contemporaries as well, would piss off at lunchtime if there was a, well, would if there was a shoot to be done, they would go to the pub. Whereas I would always go to the shoot. Same with the music recording. If there was a music recording on, they'd go to the pub. I was always go to the music recording or the puppet making place or the set design place. And what I learned with those, um, Fiona mentioned before, the calibre of people that we've been lucky enough to work with from prop designers and set designers. And this is pre-Photoshop, yeah? I did a front cover for people in wool, which was a, a wool skull cap on a beautiful, beautiful model with golden real horns, real horns dipped in copper and then gold. I had to go and get them from the abattoir Huh? bury them to get them dried out so and then give them to a dude who I don't know I left them on that woman's doorstep in South Yarra and she had a, a booty copper dipping booty business so she you had to be copper dipped so they conduct before you can put gold on them then give them to the gold guy then get the makeup woman the, the wardrobe woman to stitch them onto this skull cap now it's photoshop now it's just fum 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 you know but we made all of these things or we had them made we found people who could make them people who worked in fiberglass fabric tiles ceramics you had they're still out there they're still out there i had this little black box that was like the who's who of every creative skill that you could want from embroidery to, you know, concrete sculpture or whatever, ice carvers, you name it. Um, there were foods, food stylists that were big back then. There were full-time typographers. Yes, and I think yeah. that's I, – I miss the typographers too. But now – I love their craft. Because of Photoshop and that you don't need – you know, a lot of art directors will do that image manipulation themselves um, – but still, I would go to the music sessions, I would go everywhere. So uh, it's changed a lot in that regard, I think, where you're not surrounded by people with these incredible standards of, you know, choreography or composition or whatever it might be. And there was always negotiation to do with those people because they want to give you what they want to give you for the set design. It might not be exactly what you want. You might need to tweak it. You have to deal with them. You have to change things. You learn a lot in that collaborative process. You're still a boss. But, you know, you learn a lot. So it's changed a lot. Um, it's more solo, I think, the industry. From what I look from the outside of the advertising agencies that I can see, it's very young, blokey again, which is a shame because they don't understand a lot, young men, let's face it. And, um, well, uh, what I'm trying to get at there is that empathy is a really important thing in advertising. And if you're self-obsessed, empathy is not really there. So you see stupid ads for tampons that you just think, a bloke wrote that for sure. You see stupid ads for all sorts of stuff that you know ha have not had the interrogation they need and there's not, it would seem, the rigour inside anymore to ensure that the creative staff do that interrogation properly before the creative solutions come out. But maybe I'm generalising. Maybe I'm a grumpy old lady. What do you think, Fee? <laughs> well, it's interesting <laughs> what you say because, yes, uh, the delivery of how we do the work has changed, uh, uh, you know, monumentally. But the the what actually goes on in an agency, I don't think has changed enough. I think uh, uh, the having had roles in uh, Australia as a national creative director internationally, in I worked in London, had to do a job as an international creative director uh, for uh, several years, and. What I see mm. is not enough change um, in terms of that creative director role and the, 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 the mentoring that they have the opportunity to do. Mm. And it's still very blokey. And that's, I think, a great shame. Very blokey to this day. I think uh, one has to have an appreciation and respect for what's gone before so that, you know, you can see the incredible uh, 
work that has been done and also the incredible potential ahead. Uh, the only real way you could really realise, I think, that potential is to see the leaps and bounds in incredible design that's that's happened here in Australia, around the world. I think, you know, uh, the world shrunk a lot. Uh, I think there was very iconic Australian design. Uh, we had uh, Slip Stop Slap. Uh, Alex that, Stitt. Alex Stitt was an incredible um, um Cartoonist, artist, uh, visual communicator, and, and there really was is. yeah, there was a, a stra- yeah. there was Mimo Cozzolino who mm. did a beautiful graphic design. Uh, uh, look at look it up, you know. I'm hoping it'll be on Wikipedia or one of those somewhere. There was great designers here, and of course, you know, people have built on you know the leaps and bounds that they have made, you know, and you know that's the evolution. I think that's that's what's so exciting, and also you might just pick something up, you might learn something. Well, in any discipline, you have to study history. I don't care who you are, if you're a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, you must understand the precedents. You can't be a practitioner uh, with any skill if you don't understand what's gone on before. Or you'll think that you're a legend by designing something that's been done already. And so you must know the history of your own discipline. Um, And so history is important from the point of view of giving yourself the meat and bones of what it is that you actually do. You need to understand, you, go, oh, you only learn when you look at how other people have expressed certain things, whether you're a writer, whatever, as I say. Um, so history is really important to, to put that, you know, meat and bones on your craft. Um, but it's also important, uh, we're talking about women in advertising here or in graphic design here, it's important that you, um, that where possible, history acknowledges people who've come before and gone before with the correct emphasis. Instead of, um, uh, I I mentioned to you that, you know, if you walk around the streets of Melbourne, there are sculptures everywhere. There's bronze blokes on every corner. None of them are women. And when I did the first edition of the Melbourne book in 2000 or something, 1999 or something, um, I did the first ever sculpture archive. There was none. I mean, it's only a young city. It's two nanas old, 179 years. So the work has not been done right, on this city and documenting its history. And so I realised then that there was no archive. So I thought, oh, I'll skip around and do it. So I have actually legged it the the length and breadth of this grid and beyond the fringe to find out what sculpture and statuary is there in the street space, yeah? And they're all blokes. I found half a woman in the garden shed with the polystyrene and fertiliser at Treasury Buildings Treasury Garden, sorry, Mary Gilbert, who came over on the first fleet. So it was very important for me when I went to RMIT to see Joan of Arc on her horse and go, yeah, go, girl, it made you feel good. And and role models are really important, really important. And if young women in advertising can see Fee and I, that's really important because you think, I can do that too. But when you realise that there's a, a French, you know, um, religious zealot, there's a, a nun, there's a mermaid and there's a... Oh, there's another nude. Oh, Diana, I think. We're from, you know, the Elysian Fields. None of them are real people and none of them are Melbourne women. And the only other memorials there are in the street space are concrete blocks dedicated to the nurses of, of, of the Second World War. There's a twisted uh, scroll thing up near, you know, Parliament, which is meant to represent suffrage, women's suffrage or something. Um, so where are their figures? Why don't they have form? You know, why, aren't, why don't, aren't they figurative representations of women who've done stuff? And I have a list in my book a mile long of really fantastic women that have come through Melbourne that should be in our street corners. So it is important. History is important for role models, really important for role models. It makes you think you can do it. And the article you mentioned when we first were speaking about from the Wizard of, Wizards of Oz was a tribute that I put in there for Julie Opre because she was a terrific stylist, women in, woman in advertising, art director stylist. And when we were quite late in our relationship, I said to her that she has always been my role model. And she said, oh, no, 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 you're mine. And the two of us fell about laughing because we had... Um, misunderstood our relationship. I thought she was the mentor and I was the, you know, grasshopper. Vice versa was the case. So isn't that interesting that you can delude yourself as to who's inspiring you (laughs) and it still works? 
but it's important. That role model thing is really important. It does fire you on. It does make you think, well, if you can do it, I can do it. But she said I, she, she said I should try this and she knows stuff, so I should try it. I can do it, you know. It is important. History is really important. Having worked in the advertising industry now for 36 years, uh, give or take the decades, um, uh, I think there is... Uh, well, there... There used to be a, a, a swagger to uh, advertising. Um, uh, it wasn't just the, the Ford, the Holden cars, you know, uh, that were made here and the, the Chico rolls and, and the, the humour and the, the... In any form of advertising and design, culture creeps through. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a, a very distinctive Australian cultural element to, to those that, that made it uniquely Australian. Anyhow, have a Winfield, All et cetera. That. Yeah, so, so it came through in the language, it came through in the boldness of colour, it came through in the approach. Uh, so uh, happily, yes, I think there was something somewhat naive at times. It, it didn't have the, um, the slickness of UK or USA, who were the big uh, meccas at the time. And I remember going from Australia to working in London uh, because that's what you had to do, cut your teeth in London in those days, and um, and really being kind of astonished at the sort of the professionalism and level of how things were yeah, done, you yeah, know. And yeah. they had art buyers. You had agencies that had a whole department of art buyers mm. that would say, do you want to work with David Bailey? Do you want to, you know, we'll get his folio in. I mean, it was a very different league to uh, picking up the phone and going, g'day, you know, which is sort of how it was here. But uh, I think as the world shrinks and um, uh, we've become very multinational, uh, that has changed. I think we have, we're not quite as, other than the, maybe the lamb ads and the ones that really play on our Australian uh, voice mm. uh, and and get to drive the humour. I think humour is very important part of that. Uh, even in design, you have humour. You know, uh, what do you think, Marie? Well, I think that's all absolutely true. And um, any culture will reflect, you know, the the essential whatever it is uh, in the advertising will reflect that. Um, and I suppose there's that irreverence and there's that cheekiness and so on. But really also Australia in every field, whether it's music or film or advertising, has always striven, strived really hard to try to get to the level that the Brits and the, the Yanks get to. So there's kind of a fearlessness about it I think that's really nice. It's a brave, why not, have a go. And I think What can was... happen? What's the worst that can happen? Let's try this, you know. Who's going to stop us? Because we're way down here at the bottom of the globe or have been. We're not so remote anymore, so that's perhaps changed. But there was certainly courage and certainly madness and certainly um, just, you know, throw caution to the wind sometimes with certain creative executions. But as I say, it's the same in advertising, in film, in art, in music or any discipline in the um, antipodes uh, has always been a bit brave, I think. Well, the benefits are that uh, if you want to start your own agency, you get a profile, uh, and that's mm -hmm. a, a very fine thing. Uh, you also get recognition from your peers. Uh, clients feel a bit more comfortable with you if they uh, know that you've uh, got a profile for the work that you've done, and I would hope that the profile and visibility comes from the calibre of your work, mm -hmm. um, not just because you're some voice piece or, uh, you know, I kind of find it really irritating when they go guru of the industry, you know, to, about people. And I think, well, no, I, I, you're not. this is what I meant when I said our name withheld. Guru, I know, very famous guru, paid two grand a week to a promotion company to get his name up where it is and where it has been since the, that was the mid 85s until now. So there's a lot of people, can, you can get profile many ways. I think she and I have always work. had yeah. a synergy about with folio first, you know, and everything should come from that. Your reputation should come from that. To a degree that women always do this and it's actually a bit of a mistake because even though we're right, that's how it should be, that's not how it is, and you do have to put some time and effort into your profile or you'll just disappear because the guys are so busy 
blowing smoke. So, it, you know, you really do ha actually have to put some effort into that because um, it doesn't come automatically, even though it should. You know, it's not that kind of... The world is never that kind of place. But we've always put our folios first. Mm. The reputation and the quality of the work, we felt, has always been the most important thing. But, but uh, particularly in the trade press, uh, mm -hmm. like any press, they either want a, a victim or a victor. And so... Uh, yeah. uh, it's always I'm, more complex. It's, it's very complex. And, um, and things like campaign brief, uh, now they have a, a whole anonymous slagging off uh, that happens about work, which is, you know, very cowardly um, and, and uh, is that Is that an analysis of campaigns? Uh, yeah. they, they Yep. Yeah. And uh, I think, and so... Uh, it's not I, very edifying, is it? It's like all social media really at the moment, I, I suppose. So there is always a risk when you put yourself out there that uh, there is a vulnerability. And I think uh, uh, designers, creative people generally are more sensitive because they put their heart and soul into their work. So they get affected when it's critiqued uh, and, and particularly negatively. And they, they feel fantastic when people love it, you know. So um, I think you have to just... Uh, have belief in yourself uh, and be brave enough to be visible, uh, but don't let that define you as a creative person. It depends what kind of career you want. If you want to end up with, you know, your own TV program or whatever it might be, then there's certainly Get a an PR avenue. Agent. There's certainly an <laughs> avenue. So everyone wants something different out of this discipline in the, at the end of the day. And I suppose when you're starting out as a young student, graphic designer or viscom or whatever, you don't realise that there are stranded options like that, that that lay ahead. You think, oh, I'm just going to design a beautiful wine label or make a gorgeous brochure or something. You don't necessarily realise that you can turn it into something else if you want, you know, a, a, a speaking life or a, whatever. I think also just, just on that, I, I know that I went into graphic design thinking with a teaching scholarship, thinking that that would be the outcome. During that time, my, I went into the degree stream, I ended up in an advertising agency, I ended up seeing a whole raft of careers and options open up to me and, and I think that's the thing is that put yourself out there and see what opens up to you and uh, it's not necessarily where you think you might be headed. I think, you know, I think both of us have put a lot in. Um, we've given our absolute best quality-wise. We've given time and, you know, we've managed, you know, they say you can't do it all. We have. We've got families and gorgeous husbands and great careers and great futures and still looking after our health, which is fantastic too. So um, it's a matter of balance and it's a matter of sharing whatever you can with the rest of the industry. And so I reckon I've given some great briefs to some terrific creative people and given them the chance to do music and art and film and backdrops and Christ knows what that, you know, they might have had to do rubbish with somebody else. <laughs> but because we care about what we do, it's been really lovely work and a really lovely journey. And, uh, and I have the chance to put back, and I do. Um, and I still see lots of people from back in the day inside. And, uh, yeah, so done my best. Fee has. Uh, as Marie said, as the mother of three girls and uh, having spent a couple of decades in the industry, I still believe my best work is ahead of me. And uh, mm. that's uh, here, a here. really here, here. Uh, exciting uh, I'm getting prospect. better every five minutes. I'm doing stuff I'm, that I couldn't imagine, you know, I would come up with. It's mm. just... So editing. Mm. And, and even though uh, I'm now sort of running my own show and having to kind of take on, you know, all these other roles that suddenly, which is, you know, producing um, strategy, all... all things that you picked up over the years, uh, it, it allows you to use what you've learned from the past, pass that on to the next generation that are coming through because I'm working with fabulous young, young filmmakers, editors, designers, uh, and I think that's where we are still working together in a collaborative way and hopefully we can mentor uh, the youth coming through the way we were mentored by some amazingly talented people when we were coming through. And I think the one thing I would say is respect the people that have done it in the past because you will learn and there are things you can learn. It's not just all about apps and programs and, and the, the no. latest thing from Apple, it, you know, it, or the creative no. cloud or, you know. No. 
And the more that you hone that um, creative ideas muscle, your brain, the more you work with it and push it and push it, it'll happen one day that you'll go, oh, my God, I can do this forever. I know how this works now. It's just totally reliable. I can just – there's always another one in there. There's just – it's limitless, and you oh, that's true. suddenly the is very true. suddenly realize mm. that you can, can you can relax. You know the old deadline thing when you start about oh god I've got to have an idea by whatever the deadline is. The day that switches for you, it's just fantastic. It's just a pleasurable ride from there because you know you can do it. It's just, I suppose it's sort of like an athlete who knows they can get over that certain height bar, um, and it has to be something I love and I'm really happy with. And if I can trust myself to do that, it's lovely. So we're looking forward to a future of doing more of the same. Hopefully. And I've got a young daughter who wants to be an animator and, and seeing what she does is, is fantastic. So I think, yeah, there's, there's a wonderful future ahead for uh, what's coming through but also lots to learn from the past. Mm.